Previously on Anything Goes. I mean, that's the trick to sort of get your opinion and make it funny enough that sort of people don't even realize that they're learning something along the way. Well, at some point you have to examine what your opinions really are and why you're doing certain jokes, which is something that I had to reckon with because I sort of came from a tradition of of uh, confrontational comedy, of, uh, of provoking audiences and, and, and creating uh, a, a sort of like, you know, a challenge. Right. And, and then, you know, if you're an angry person and you have to decide what are you really angry about? Are you really angry about what you're talking about or are you just angry? Yeah. And, and, you know, there, there's something about doing self-righteous material that it creates a, a, a sense of, of self up there that you can walk off and go, see, they're fucking stupid. Yeah. They didn't get me. <laughs> right. Or like, you know, you know like, I, see, I showed them or whatever. But, but, you know, I think deeper than that with my own personal experience is like, well, why are you doing that? Is that an emotional problem or do you really believe that shit? And now... Let's get to a new exciting show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready for some laughs? Are you? Don't touch that dial. It was molested and it brings back horrible memories. This is Anything Goes with Darren Frost. How the fuck am I funny? Dave Martin. What have we got here? A fucking comedian. And Kathleen McGee. And I'll execute every motherfucking last one of you. Can you dig it? The medication is bad enough and now I've gotten a daughter under control. If I have a coffee, it's... News? Okay. Well, anyway, I just... I. I... All yesterday, you uh, went a day. So a day I went a day, food. and and then this morning I had that sort of like, it just kind of hit me out of nowhere. I just had that punch in the gut feeling of like, oh my god, I I, I got to get this out of me. It's like the it's like the that an alien that's like the baby alien from Aliens, right? It's gonna come out of either out of my chest or out of my butthole. So uh, I, I, I bet I bet Marla Lukowski is gonna be real proud of this opening to her. Oh, she's episode. gonna enjoy this. Well, you yeah, know, I think so. I mean. Two guys it's, talking about poop. Doesn't get any classier than that. Well, I don't know. Well, we can maybe edit some things out, but we probably won't. But, no. but then, then it, it just happened, and oh my god, it, what, what? And then, and then the bidet afterwards, fantastic. Oh, and, I'm um, I'm on team bidet, man. When did you get one? So I've got the arm, you know, the arm that you attach to a toilet, so it's yeah. like a bidet. Right. I got it about two, three months ago, and it's the fucking greatest thing they ever made. Oh, okay. So you want, and you realize that you still do need toilet paper in your life. Yeah, of course. Of course. You, nowhere you had, near as much. Right. Well, I, I mean, yeah, probably not as much. But I mean, you said there was, a, you had a friend that said, oh, you got to get one. You'll never need toilet paper again, which that's not true. But, um, but yeah, the one that I have, it's like a jack in the box. I don't know if I'm going to get like a light fountain from like those old mm -hmm. water fountains from that you'd used to actually drink from. Uh, right. Or uh, I'm going to get like one of the, like a fire hose that's used to like separate so, protesters mine's a handle about that long it's got a yeah. thing on it to turn it on and off you just put right. it in there you and you get to set the you know sometimes you get a little crazy and put the pressure too high and, <laughs> or and it's your birthday like, whoa yeah it's your birthday oh no i mean i'm gonna do a series yeah. of videos of bidet reactions because i'm it's so already on it's that already exists does that really exist already yes it does yeah well where do i find i okay well but, i'm not gonna but, look but, them but up. it's there's like tons of videos on youtube bidet reactions Oh, because they're oh. they're still seen as not cool in America. So in the all through Europe, they use bidets. So a lot of Americans first time using a bidet, they're like, oh, 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 whoa, yeah, all kinds of those videos, tons. Is you're, there, five years, think, you're five years too late, Dave. Well, I'm okay. Well, that, that would be your the next first. album. Five years would be late. the first. Five years too. Um, well, it's either going to be called bad or I'm tired. Or I'm sick of this shit. Um, what? Uh, yeah, why so do you think that is? Why do you think there is that paranoia of of uh, of uh, a, a reluctancy to get a bidet? So there's a whole argument. You can research this because I, I did online. So when people went off to war in World War II and one, they learned about bidets because they were generally used in brothels. Right. So no man wanted to come back and go, I just use this amazing thing. It's called a bidet. Oh, where did you see that? Oh, in a brothel, you know? Yeah. So they were not ever talked about and seen as something dirty and wrong. So right. it never caught on here. Oh. Well, I mean, what do you think that is? I mean, do you think do you think there's a, a questioning of one's 
Because women man's... don't like their husbands going with whores? What do you? No, no, no. I was going to say, uh, oh, do you think there's a questioning of one's sexuality when you use a bidet? Because that's no. always seems like, I mean, that's always the first thing of that every guy talks about. That when... would be like an 80s teen movie. You used what? What are you, gay? That would be yeah. like that. No, yeah. no, no. But I'm, I'm saying sort of like some, I mean, that's the only thing of like, that's the hack joke when it comes to getting your prostate checked of like, right. hey, what if I like it? Yeah. I was like, well, there's a, another a hole for adventure, you know, it's like, right. that's right go for it. I mean, I'm not, oh, Choose I mean, why be bothered? Whole adventure. Yeah. Turn yeah. to 49, <laughs> put something in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's just, it's, it's a, it, it does seem, uh, yeah, it is an odd sensation. But, and like yeah. I said, you always have to watch out for the butt water that gets kept up there afterwards. Right. So you want to, you want to have why a, use the toilet paper to dry yourself off. And right. Yeah. But I mean, there's still water that's trapped up there that yeah, you have to yeah. go back. Okay. So I heard that. Well, uh, yeah. You want ahead. to talk about the bonfire? Sure. Okay. So a former, uh, he was on our old show. Uh, mm -hmm. I you, I'm sure you can still listen to it uh, if you go into the archives. Uh, but uh, last night I was listening to uh, the bonfire with Big J Okerson uh, and Dan Soder's usually on it, but he's uh, off. And uh, so Ron Bennington would filled it in, and they were talking about. Uh, actually, they were talking about. Um, uh, a fight between Luis J. Gomez and Kurt Metzger. And I guess Luis threw a cup at him. But the one thing uh, about throwing a cup that is full is you can't really wind it back because right. then all the liquid's going to spill out. And then right. you're just On throwing you. an empty yeah. cup. Yeah. So um, they were talking about that. And then Big J, you know, brought it up. He, they played your clip of getting assaulted in, uh, in London. And, uh, and they said that how they broke it down on that was one of the first videos that they broke down on Legion of Skanks. Um, right. And uh, and yeah, and they played it and uh, it was a uh, I don't know, it was it was quite humorous. They all had a good laugh about it. But it, but it was like really, I guess what, what was more funny was how Canadian they made it. The clip sound, because right. I guess the guy after you get hit, there's a guy that stands up for the the guy that chucked the glass at you and says, yeah, his mom's dead there, bud. Yeah. Or his mom just died, bud. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just one of those like funny hockey arguments. It was like, Hey, what the fuck you're doing there, bud? It couldn't be. It always, it cringes me sometimes when how Canadians or how Canadian things sometimes seem to Americans. Right. Cause I mean, <clears throat> I don't, I don't sound st stereotypically Canadian. No, no, and no. And I don't think I don't, I don't either because I've made a career doing American cartoons and you know, in the 20 years I've been doing it, maybe twice they said you said sorry the wrong way, but that's it. Right, right. But I mean, even still, it's not like you grew up in the sticks and right. And uh, I mean, I've I've grown up in the city my entire life, so I've never really had that moment of like, oh, I I say a a lot or anything mm -hmm. like that. I mean, I probably did when I was younger, but but yeah, no, it was just funny to hear that clip, and I know how much you a don't enjoy that publicity or that side of. Well, you, it's, it's not that I don't enjoy it. So here's the problem with the clip. The clip is what I'm known for. That's it. Let's be honest. 30 years of me doing town after town, releasing all the specials I've done. The one thing I'm known for is that clip. That's fine if there was some kind of benefit to it. There's not a real benefit to it. In fact, there was many club owners that didn't want to book me after that clip was posted because they think that's all I did was right. just react to hecklers. And I was a heckler guy like Steve Hofsetter is. I don't do that. This was just one night that I was recording um, because at the time I was getting some threats and other things. So I just, for posterity, I recorded it. And it's it's only led to nothing positive. Let's just say that. Right. And I'll just leave it at that. But I thought that you would be more upset the fact that you're not there to give your side of the story and defend it. Because, I mean, there's so much more to it. Of course. I mean, e even when you take in the context of the club at the time and yeah. who the management was. And, and the club record... owner kept repeatedly in public saying, I deserve to get hit by the glass. Yeah. And staff, staff backed her on that, that they that they felt physical violence was the answer to anything I said on stage. Right. This, you know, this was a whole fiasco that happened. And, you know, then, it, you know, lines are drawn in the sand because some comics are friends with this club owner. But it's like, I don't care if you're friends. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Right. There's no reason to escalate it to violence the way they did at a dirty X-rated show. Yeah. I mean, I think that if anything that would bug you would be the fact that you can't really give you're not always there to give context to it. So, right. No, I agree. Um, and and they could easily call me and we could talk about it on, on the show or whatever. And 
we were in New York the one time with Legion of Skanks doing their uh, Halloween show, and I was waiting in the wings to go on, and it never happened. You know, I I don't think they don't want me on. It's just I'm not in New York often, and maybe now we could do something over a Zoom. But every time they, and I'm happy they talk about it because at least it gets my name out there, I guess. But mm -hmm. Each year it goes by, it's something that it's like, do I really want to keep talking about 1998? Well, I mean, no, but I mean, it could be, it's, I always think it's sort of like your candy man, you know, like the Sammy Davis Jr. song that he never wanted to do. And as soon as it became a hit, he was like, oh shit. Okay. Well now I like this song. Yeah. And so it's sort of like something you can kind of go back to, but, but yeah, I mean, next time we go down to New York, you should try to set that up. I mean, it would have been, uh, it, it would have been great, but I mean, they weren't, it's like no one they weren't slighting you in any way with the whole oh yeah no no i know that yeah because yeah. it's sort of like they did because you know i mean even every Gio time could... every time i've met big j since then he's been nothing but really nice and and you know hey man how you doing oh my god that clip and you know we still make fun of that clip but i, I know when he says that he's not putting me down right. he's like saying it's such a fucking crazy clip that we have to talk about it well and, and it you, is and yeah it but is. you you also do the this is not a choose your own adventure and yeah. something and so and he I says page 47 i fuck your mom yeah yeah well i mean uh, we can show that clip again if you want but uh if uh but i mean he does say you have a good line that you throw out at him so right anyway shannon's here so okay, let's bring her in okay here is shannon this is chuck Byrne, and you're listening to anything goes with darren frost on xm And it better look better than us. That's all I'm saying. Oh, well, it's funny that you, you can see the walls in the space between your headphones. Yeah, I know. Right, yeah, right here. Yeah. And Shannon looks like she's going to get her passport taken. I know. I don't have you listen. I don't I don't you want to know where I am? I'm in my fucking laundry room. That's where I am. I'm in oh, my, okay. it's the only place that I have light in my oh, there goes okay. the mystery. OK, yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> You have a laundry room. I have a laundry closet. That's... I have a laundry room. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. you live in a house. I do. Yeah. Do you watch? I. Uh, my... I have a laundry floor, by the way. I don't. Ah, uh, stop. Lottie da. Uh -huh. I. You know what? Uh, Shannon, you live in a house, and Darren, mm -hmm. you live in a house. I live in yes. a condo, and yes. I've been watching a lot of. Uh, I started watching American Horror Story, and it's sort of like. I, I mean, I I enjoy horror movies, but the one thing I'm always sort of like, I like living in a condo. Because you almost never see haunted apartment movies, right? Or haunted right. condo movies, right? That's a, that's the thing holding you back, Dave. That's the only thing holding you back. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, right, and a couple enough. thousand. Not the million dollar, yeah, the million <laughs> yeah. dollar down payment. That yeah, you the money thing, thing but yeah. like all things, all like all things in my life, I always like to find other things that I can blame. Yes. Before I get to the root issue of what yeah. my problem. I'd love to is. see you at an open house. Is, is this ghost free? Can you put <laughs> yeah, that on yeah. paper? Ghost free. Yeah. Hey, but if you go to New Orleans, a lot of the condos and the apartments there are, are they advertise they have ghosts or yes. no ghosts. Yes. Oh. So yeah. Well, I think I'd like, get... to, I'd like to think that the, the ghosts in New Orleans are more interesting than Toronto ghosts. I think they'd have more <laughs> stories to tell of just like old yeah. musicians and yeah. Drinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless they unless they stay kept you up all night, you know, playing instruments and things like that, then that would be a drag. But uh <laughs> So but we yeah. haven't we haven't talked about this yet. Me and Dave were talking about things that you know you don't want to talk about, Shannon. Trust me. Um, no, we, maybe I do. I don't want to talk. Well, how, how, how long have you ever gone, Shannon, without uh, defecating? Defecating. Yeah, Taking, uh, a uh, week. One week. A week. Oh, no, that yeah. is not true. No, it's absolutely one hundred percent true. Okay, w were you trying? And then to when a baby in? came out, like what the fuck comes no, out after? No, I was having a lot of issues. This was years ago. Uh, I had to go for like tests and all these other things. And then I ended up just getting a suppository and I was like, all right, let's shove this up my ass and see what can you about. just get a plumber snake for humans and just <laughs> shove it up in there. And yes, like yeah, after a, a week, a one a week back or something. Yeah. One week. Oh, wow. And yeah. So what was wrong with you? Uh, not enough fiber. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Fiber is no. literally thing. that answer they use in every commercial. It was is literally your problem. More fiber. Wow. I was not eating. I was eating uh, 
I think I was eating a lot of low fat at the time, right? Um, but not, but not a lot of fiber. Just a oh, okay. Like so, like day I, five, day five, you haven't gone. Is yeah. that when you start like going to the doctor, or did you go before? Day, like, when do you go? I didn't say, even go to the doctor. I was just like, I'm in a lot of pain, right? And I think Kelly's mom was st- staying with us at the time, uh, and she's like, you should try suppository, right? So, and I'm like, oh, all right, yeah. And then, oh uh, wow. So what, right before it happened, did you say, did you yell out, are you ready for your headliner? <laughs> <laughs> and then kaboom, he came out. No, loud. I was like, the baby's coming. That's what I was yelling. Okay. Yeah. It's like, man, were there, <laughs> did you find, did your car keys come out as well? That whole, it oh didn't even take that long after you put the suppository. No, it doesn't. It was yeah. like maybe 20 minutes and then it's yeah. like, all right. Oh, okay. But, but here's the other thing before I went for the tests for another time, because I was, I was constantly having this problem of backing up, backing up and not having movements and stuff so i uh had to drink citromeg and i don't know if you know what that is it's what they give you to like clear out your whole system before you go mm-hmm. in for either a colonoscopy or oh, okay. a, yes. they yes. put you on the table and you drink the weird shit and they sh- jiggle your rand to see where it goes and so i uh had to drink citromeg and for like half an hour nothing happened and when i told the nurse that she was like half an hour i go yeah mm-hmm. for half an hour nothing mm-hmm. and she goes most people drink it and within 10 minutes you are basically shitting your pants. It's right. Over. Yeah. 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 So I drink it. It's like three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm waiting, like 3 30. Finally it starts. Then it doesn't stop. Then you're back and forth to the bathroom, back and forth. Right. Right. And then I'm like, I have to drive to Barry to do a show now. Of course you do. Point. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, that's always yeah. what happens when you have to go to yeah. Barry. Start Speaking at three o'clock. Your... Start at three yeah. o'clock and yeah. then you got a show at seven. Yeah. yeah so then about I was like, your pants. Yeah. I was timing it between each time I had to take a uh, uh, shit. And then it was at one point, I'm like, okay, I can make it half an hour. Right. And this is back when traffic wasn't as bad. So right. I would, I was like, I can make it to the first stop in like Vaughn where the yeah, gas station There's the roadside is. thing. Yeah. Yeah. If I have to take a shit. So I make it past that. I'm like, okay, still doing fine. Then I'm like, maybe I can make it to the Husky, which is a little further up the yep. road. Yes. Make yes. It, oh, no. Nope. Then I get to, I made it all the way to Barry. I was like a full hour of like, woo, made it. Ran into the bathroom, went to the bathroom. Okay, done. Like everybody in Barry does. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and then while on stage, I was also saying, like, if I leave it like one minute, like if I just, like say hey guys i gotta go it means i'm taking a shit just so you know i told the audience what happens yeah and even a comic who was in barry at the time when i got there sean collins was there and he had been through citromeg many times for different tests and things did he try well. to date your shit did he try yes. to get his number did. Did he yeah. try to get his number okay it, yeah. it was the right age uh, it's <laughs> fresh and ripe that's right yeah. uh and he uh He's like, I can't believe you just did that. I can't believe you just drank that and then drove. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's worse than drinking and driving, I guess. Shitting and driving. I don't know. Okay. Now, now, Shannon, I uh, I used to ask this on, a, uh, on an old show, but if you had to give up one thing, either shitting or or, or uh, urinating, pissing, what would it be? I, I never understood this question because it's what do you not mean? possible. Well, it's like not if possible. You, if, if one thing didn't happen, oh. like if you, if one thing, if, okay. It was oh, like, pissing, for sure, pissing. Yes, there we if go. I didn't have to piss. That would be amazing. Right. If that just like leaked out of my eyes in the morning or something, yeah. that would be wonderful. <laughs> well, no, yeah. it wouldn't leak out of your eyes in this scenario. It just wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen? Pissing yeah. for sure. Yeah. Right. And you, you got a brand new purse, you know? Well, because, it's like, of course, uh, because pissing happens more than shitting and it's more awkward to try absolutely. to, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. also, uh, I even talk about it in my act about having to do Kegels because you piss your pants all the time. Yeah. Right. Right. So, yeah, no, I don't, you know, you jump around as a woman as you get older and you're pissing your pants. I also oh. have heard that it happens for guys. It does. Right. And what happens for guys is you can't sleep through the night. Like I get up two to three times a night. Yeah. But how much are you drinking before you go to bed? Not even that much, but it's just, it's always two to three times. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a very suspicious drink of uh, yeah. uh, that a- a- awkward pause. I so think I caught my tears a... in here. It's a little cider. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Hey, guys, this is uh, John B. Duff here uh, sitting with the, these three fuck faces on uh, XM Radio. Anything goes. Oh, faces made for fucking. Or did I have to say serious there? So no, this it, wasn't nah, serious. No. no, no, that was good. That was good. The word. Right, okay. Great. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. 
So uh, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the show is that we're talking about an era of comedy that there doesn't seem to be much online or, you know, really people talk about. And that's the very kind of beginnings of stand up in Canada, the late 70s, early 80s. And of course, you are a vital part of that. And, um, you know, I was talking to Kenny Robinson, who I'm very, very good friends with. Yeah. And we were talking about this. And, of course, she, he's always talked about you and such a high esteem and say, you know, I got to get you on the show. And my first time I ever saw you was on The Shirley Show. <laughs> and so for the people who don't know what The Shirley Show is, it was kind of like Can uh, Canada's Oprah. Um, you know, it was a yeah, show was Donahue kind of like, wouldn't you say, Dave? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I think it. It was one of those weird things because I remember it was like, yeah, it was it was going to be uh, Canada's answer to Oprah or an answer to Jenny Jones or Jerry Springer yes. or all these that wave of, you know, host and going up and down the aisles Daytime and asking questions. Show. Yeah. And then it, it seemed to get. But I think it, we tried to do the Shirley show at the peak of sort of the 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 smash TV, the trash TV yeah. of Jerry Springer. And Shirley was very much like, well, we don't want to do those sort of shows. Right. And it turned out that whether it was Canada or America, the public wanted those shows because Shirley didn't really last too and, long. And I'm glad you said that. And I know it's a bit long winded before we talk to you. My question was going to be about Shirley, the show, because they I, at that time, they didn't want to really do a show like that. And then you kind of have these comics come on who are kind of in that category of adult humor. Let's just say that uh, in terms of, of topics and, 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 and jokes. How was your experience doing that show? Well, if you saw the clip, mm -hmm. <laughs> you may know how it was. It was very uncomfortable. Yes. Mark, Mark Breslin was there, who is, you know, the king of comedy clubs in Canada. And there was Kenny beside me, who at the time was a junior comic because I was a senior comic. I was the right. headliner and he was the up and coming and doing well. And yeah. now he now he's the king. And um can't remember the others but there was a like a philosopher of sorts yeah uh, the nebulous kind of presence uh, no offense to him but you know yeah and uh and, and i watched the clip because kenny sent it to me and i i liked it. i was like oh my god i look so young my skin so beautiful my look at my hair so peculiar um but i found shirley to be quite hostile and <laughs> aggressive and hostile towards me right. of all people and you know quote well marla do your you know gynecology jokes and don't you find that offensive i said not at all and but you're you're condemning women by i said not at all i'm actually saying this that and the other it was very strange watching her go at me and mm -hmm. then it was well do you find that there's anything that should be sacred and i i, I think i mentioned one or two things and it was so uncomfortable i can't tell you because at the time i wasn't getting along with mark i think i was blacklisted then right and right. it was very uncomfortable but i was holding my own and had a long list of accomplishments that shirley was gracious enough to list yeah and i held my own and she did make sure that i got my turn to speak mm -hmm. and she was good about that going along the panel and everybody getting turn to talk but it was beyond tense. You don't know. There's stuff behind the scenes that mm, I'd rather not say, maybe, because uh, right. I'm on good terms with people now. But we'll, we'll, we'll probably be able to show a clip or two. I mean, I can. Yes. Oh, I that can would be those, great. That would I be great. Okay, I can show that that stuff from YouTube. I, I've, yeah. I've seen those clips before. Because um, there's yeah. part one, two, and three. Pardon me, David. Yep. And there's there's one of the parts where it comes back into right focusing on me. So make sure you get that clip. In. We're talking about offensive humor today, and I'd like you to meet Marla Lukowski. She's been performing stand-up comedy in Canada for 17 years. She's also starred in many television shows and commercials. She's currently living and working in Los Angeles. Please welcome Marla Lukowski. you've noticed but I'm rather short you know people always come up to me and they say Marla you're so short gosh you're so short so I developed a comeback to protect myself the next time someone comes up and says hi god you're short I say sure I'm short but you should see the size of my clitoris <laughs> oh, that bothers you yes but that is 
is the name of the organ? The elbow, the hand, the heart. It's in the dictionary. I mean, stars are named after Clitoris Leachman. I mean, just relax. Okay, you are relaxed. But you know, folks, I go to the gynecologist a lot. And I mean a lot. Not because I'm health conscious. Because I want some action up there. Hey, it's a bad year, bad year for Marla. But don't you ever get the feeling, ladies, that gynecologists were really air traffic controllers in another life. Little more down, little more down, little more down, little more down, perfect landing. Please stow your hand luggage above your ovaries and keep your uterus in an upright position. And remember, no smoking during the examination. Hey, ain't it fun, ladies, lying there with your kneecaps and your eardrums? Huh? Remember? Isn't it comfortable? Sure it is. Get the old oven mitts on the stirrups. God forbid your feet should be cold. I'm not worried about the Trans-Canada pipeline. He's going to shove up my wads. Oh, I'm worried about my cold feet. Oh, and then he takes my kneecaps and does that little chitter-chatter just to keep my mind off of things. So, Marla, have you seen the dome open lately? Been up the CN Tower lately? And then he says the most remarkable statement any doctor can say to a woman in that position. Now, Marla, just relax. The women know what I'm talking about. That's my Thank you. Marla, has anyone ever told you that they're offended by that? Yes. Women and men. And yet you continue to do it. Oh, you want me to respond to that? What do I... I'll tell you, you know, the women do it because uh, they were taught not to talk like that and really... Uh, those terms that I am saying, I'm not saying the C word, I'm not saying, uh, you know, the slang terms. I'm saying the terms that are in health courses, in high school, that are in textbooks, that are in dictionaries. And, and I'd rather use... Yeah, but I mean, I think there's an implication there when gynecologists examine us well, that they enjoy that it a... in a way that they shouldn't be enjoying it. I mean, I think it goes beyond just using the word clitoris, you know. It's a medical examination. There was no enjoyment in anything. Believe me, there's nothing fun about a gynecological examination. I had one today, and it's not fun. <laughs> I'm not talking about whether it's fun or not. I'm talking about the fact that in, you tell a joke indicating that the enjoy. physician enjoyed it in a way that he shouldn't have. That wasn't what a patient and doctor relationship should be about. That's what I'm saying. There was no enjoyment in the... On your part. I'm talking about the doctor. Oh, well, there's that sadistic thing, you know, where all gynecologists are really perverts, you know, because when you ask them, you know, they start to use two fingers to examine me, and I asked him why, and he said he wanted a second opinion. That's a pervert! <laughs> <laughs> when you hear Mark talk about humor, that anything goes, racist humor, sexist humor, it's all okay. Is it all okay with you? No, no, it's not, because, um, because I think it does hurt people, and I think... Uh, it does perpetuate a stereotype of whatever is in people's minds and and it, Even though people are laughing, you know, I was at the club when Sam Kinison was first at Yuck Yucks I did not know this man and I walked in in the back and I saw something I'd never seen before I saw every man start to do this well-dressed with their wives going yes, 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 let's kill her, kill her, kill her And I thought this is crazy. This is scary. And I thought there's a danger here. Where do you draw the line? The problem is I don't know who should draw the line I never remembered anybody chanting, let's kill her. What no, I no, do remember is, the, is the, uh, uh, the, the, an expression of male rage, which I think is a legitimate form of feeling. And people walking out. And people walking out <laughs> in the early days, that's right. They played the theme song from Exodus. At least half the <laughs> audience left in those early days when Sam would come in. When he refined his act, and that's so subtle, people stayed. All right, let's talk to you. Uh, you know, one thing I, I thought was kind of funny, what you just said, when... When Shirley asked you, don't you think that there are some things that are sacred? And you mentioned a couple of things. I know that's like, I've had that question asked yeah. to me before. And I've had that, I'm sure Darren's asked, been asked that question. Yeah. And then you kind of like in the moment, you sort of maybe spit out you sort of one or two answers. But I think even when I've sort of responded to that question, I can't remember what I said. But even when I, whatever I just said at that time, as soon as I said it, I immediately thought of a joke about what I just said <laughs> about like, well, you shouldn't say this. And even in my head, it was just like, yeah, but what about that one joke about yeah. that? And then, so it's so hard for, I mean, I think comedians always want to say something sacred, but then at the end of the day, we're always sort of like, yeah, but I did hear a funny joke about that subject once. And well, what's sacred to you is not sacred to me. That's my answer to that. There are things that I'm not going to joke about. And there's going to be things that you joke about and that I would feel uncomfortable about. But, you know, my old adage is, you know, I'll listen to one joke. If I don't like it, I'll listen to the second joke. If I don't like it, third one I don't like, I move on. And, uh, you know, they're not, not all jokes are for everyone and they shouldn't be. 
and uh, <laughs> people vote with their wallet and they'll either come or they don't. And that's very true. And I myself have said like on the show, but, you know, yes, I think there are certain things that should be sacred. And then I'm thinking of my jokes, making a joke about incest. Well, you know, I guess my right. father didn't <laughs> fuck me enough as a child and that's why I'm not good in bed. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe I said that. And I thought it was great and funny. And yeah. then about abortions, you know, I had an abortion the other day, but don't worry, I didn't let it go to waste. I just laminated in plastic and put in my rearview mirror and it looks just like me. And I'm making these jokes about these things and I'm going, right. oh my God, I am making jokes about anything and everything, but I thought I was above it. But then I realized, and so it's just like you said. Yeah. Um, but, you know, now, that, now, if you do a joke like that, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, no. If you talk about abortion, there's going to be women in the crowd that have had abortions and are going to be upset and going to be upset that that joke is made. But my question is back. But, I, but I said it because I was pro abortion, pro choice then. I get but that, but it ahead. doesn't matter. Sometimes right. you just, you can be pro the topic and people just don't like the idea you're talking about it. Right, right. But my question is in the early 80s, specifically, there were still women who had abortions then. They were in oh, the audience. More. Right, yes. So would they get upset with you doing those jokes like maybe today, do you think? I did really well with those crazy on the edge jokes. Well, I know. That's I, Kenny, I Kenny wouldn't. That multiple times. Oh, my God. Yeah, but wait, wait, because Kenny's saying, oh, she's like disgusting. You know, I used to get that. She's disgusting. She's a loser. Well, no, no, like, he never Jack said was, that. No, never that's said that. good. That's good. But. I wouldn't talk like that now. And that's the strange thing because I'm more, yeah. I should be more, even more so because people are more evolved. But I wouldn't say the things that I was saying then because in the 80s, everything was exciting, on the edge, new, mm. daring. And we all went for it pretty well, except the mime, you know, except Paul Waldbaum, you know. So, yeah. You know. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I, my, one of my favorite quotes is, I, uh, is uh, that, uh, Comedians don't say things because they think that they're right. Be, uh, comedians say things because they think that they're funny. So it's like I could have a joke about something that I disagree with, but if, if there's, uh, but if if there's yeah. a, a joke in it, then uh, I'll do the joke. And it's not. Say, I mean, people sometimes get jokes me mixed up with people's opinions, where it's sort of the, like most of the time your opinions are what you believe in and what you're, you know, when you know you're. Your jokes are your opinions, but I mean, a lot of the times, you know, I could do, I could, I mean, uh, I'm a pretty left wing centrist sort of guy, but I mean, I could do a right wing joke and I might not agree with it, but I might do it just because I heard it or I wrote it and thought it was funny. So, right. Yeah, that's totally true. Yeah. Totally true. One, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and I don't know how to say this. So if this is the wrong way to say it, you just can say it. Me. Okay. Um, there's this idea that in the eighties, cause you already had mentioned you've been blacklisted for things right yeah and I, I don't care about why you were blacklisted but my question is do you think um i don't want to say your reputation is that you're kind of a ballsy chick back then but that's kind of what kenny said that you were on the edge you would say it how you felt it and you know not your problem if you if the people couldn't take it so that's how he kind of described you and i wonder if if you were a dude back then and you had those same problems, do you think you would have been blacklisted and had the same trouble with those kinds of things? The blacklisting only had to do with the contractual situation. So, so it wasn't gender-based? Not at all. It was It was about, oh, and it went to court no, no, and everything. Yeah, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. but no, it was about that I didn't want to sign an exclusive thing and, and be punished for playing other clubs. And, right, and right. So I was made the example of at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it had nothing to do with that. In fact, I mean, it was, I was on the edge. I was considered at the time because I was talking really fast and taking uh, improv suggestions from the audience for mm. impersonations section that I would do. And I would do the Wizard of Oz in three minutes yeah, and cut, yeah. cut to Flipper and all this stuff. So they think I was like the female Robin Williams. I was, you know, just how frenetic he was. And I was frenetic then. And they just went for it. I'll tell you the key to to how I got through it all was I didn't think of myself as a female comic. Right. It was the, 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 you know, the sexism and, and the hatred and stuff was, I wasn't looking at myself. It's like, you know, when a black person says, I didn't even think of myself as black. I just thought of myself as a doctor at this hospital and thing. Right. That's right. how I survived, right. you know, but boy, going on the road and all that stuff. And I know you want to talk about that. It was like, you are just 
you are less than a female comic. You are a token circus act. That's why you're here. You're right. here to please the feminists and stuff, but you're not even really a comic, which was right. ridiculous. And I ended up getting a lot of times the best review out of everybody in the show and was like, well, this. so then the only response was, did you blow him? Did you eat her out? How'd you get that? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, but honestly, when I thought people always ask me, so what's it like being a female comic? I said, I didn't know I was a female comic. I thought I was just a comic and I did my job and I did it well and I focused and I did it. And yeah, I was on edge and I said, whatever. Yeah, I, 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 you know, listen, listen to this. I said clitoris and the world shattered. Right. But I said to the audience, that's the name, you know, as they're groaning and going, falling out of their chairs, I said, that's the name of the organ, elbow, hand, clitoris, not my fault. That's what it's called. Right. But people thought I was on the edge because I said that. I mean, I said other things too, but hey, that was the stuff that really rocked their world. Right. And uh, two questions. One, Wizard of Oz, was that your closer? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where do you go after that? That's what I was going to say. <laughs> exactly right. I just wanted to respond to what Takir had mentioned. I had sensed that you had felt pain when you first heard the jokes when you were younger, possibly, but then you developed some armor so that you wouldn't feel pain anymore. You're stating right away that it's painful to hear racist jokes. Okay, the thing with humor is, is that the funniest things are the things that are the truth. And I find that I laugh the hardest and tears my eyes when it hits the truth. Now, I'm of Italian descent. And the things I laugh at the most are when they make fun of Italians, okay? Because a lot of times it's true. And the stereotypes exist because of the truth. And you have to learn to laugh at yourself, okay? You can't sit there and just because, you know, they make fun of your, your background, you have to laugh at yourself because it's true, okay? Uh, I'm Italian background and they say, you know, I have a lot of hair on my face. Well, you know, it's true. You know, I have to pluck my eyebrows. It happens. So I think people... Well, I pluck my eyebrows and I'm not Italian. Well, it's... What I mean, story. you know, it's, it's you don't care then. All right. Well, you have to laugh. Alan? Yeah, if I can jump in on this, uh, actually, I find, for what it's worth, Italians often have a really interesting sense of humor about themselves. We once had a, a full Italian group at Yuck Yucks. I did the whole show and of course didn't want to offend anybody. And afterwards they came up to me and said, well, we were really disappointed. I said, what's the matter? The guy said, well, no Italian jokes. Um, I think what we've seen today is that uh, now, I, I took a look at, at uh, I, I looked you up on uh, on Google and I, uh, I, I I, I did one thing really jumped out for me is uh, uh, the movie Honeymoon. Uh, yeah. Do you uh, do you do you remember going to see that movie in the theater? I went to see it several times, and I went to see it once and brought all my friends, and I took a picture of us, and we it was at the Highland at Young and St. Clair. Can I say that I think I met you outside of that theater? You uh, think so? <laughs> yeah. No, I no a hundred percent. I. Because I lived right beside, I grew up right at Young and St. Clair. You were in was Chum the, Radio, yeah. Yeah, and then right, it was, yeah, Chum Radio was down yeah. the street, and there was the Highland Movie Theater. Yeah, the, and yeah, the, the other one. Other Highland, and yes. then there was the Hollywood Theater, which I yes. eventually worked yeah. at. Oh. And I remember going to see, uh, do you remember the tagline for the movie? <laughs> you never know who you were, you never know who you married until the honeymoon. And there was like a guy's face, and I think there might have been a skull or something on it. Right, and I remember leaving the Come theater. Come on, Dave, take out your Marla doll. You can bring up the lunchbox. Okay. Okay. I remember, but I remember leaving the theater with a friend, and this is, you know, I, I whatever age I was, uh, but this is when you would just go see whatever, and I would just go see movies, right. movies, movies. And right. uh, I remember leaving the theater, and I think you were with a friend, and both of you were pointing at the thing, and then, and then, I guess whoever I was with we were mentioned. And then, yeah, you were like, oh, that, and I was like, oh, wow, you were, and for whatever reason, that has stuck in my head for, but just that moment, I could probably remember what you might've been wearing, who, the color of your friend's hair might've been blonde. And it was just this, it was just a weird moment because at that time, it's, you know, it, it was almost like the first time that I went to go and see a live stand-up comedy show. Up until that point, stand-up was just something that I saw on TV. And, and movies, you don't, you know, I mean, stuff was shot in Toronto, but you never really thought about it. And so that was honestly the first time that I think I actually saw someone in a movie and then immediately saw them in 
in real life. So oh, that's right. When and I saw that movie, it was just when I when I left the theater, that was just that is still a, a memory in my head. And you know that that film should have been better than what it was. I don't know exactly what went wrong. And they promoted it. They had two different posters. They had the normal poster with uh, Natalie Bai and John Shea and introducing Marla Lakowski, which I heard is that's the kiss of death. Whenever they do introducing, it's like, I don't know, she'll never work again. <laughs> um, but then they had this one with a skull. Yes. Head. And, and I said, and I called the producers, why'd you do this? It says it brings in more audiences. I said, but you're not a horror movie. I said, but they don't know that. No, well, I said, but they will come and be disappointed. They go, right. that's not, as long as they yeah. paid. Yeah, they paid. And that was like insane, yeah. right? Yep. So uh, now that movie was shot not in Toronto. Mm -hmm. That was shot in Montreal and New York and Paris. And Ooh. I got a two week trip into Paris. We did post production there and flew all that stuff, got a chunk of money. And I got that role based on my acting demo tape. And they flew in from Paris and interviewed me. And they said, she is Sally. She is Sally. I said, great. <laughs> Give me my script. Give me the hotel room. I'll learn my lines. No, but I, yeah, I, I clearly remember leaving that. I, I remember leaving that theater and I remember, you know, this, the interaction in front of the movie poster and yes, it was the movie poster with the skull on it. Yeah. I cannot. And this is no reflection on you, of course, okay. but I mean, I do not remember the movie very well. Yeah. Uh, I remember the lead guy being genuinely scary though, but not, I, I, don't, I don't know, but it, it was more of like a thriller uh, and sort of sleeping with the enemy ish sort of movie. Of exactly. Like, hey, yeah. That's exactly what it was. And John Shea is super talented and I really liked him. He was so nice to me. And he called me when I got the part to introduce himself. And I thought it was a friend pretending to be him. Yeah. So I was not believing him and I was hanging up on him. And then when we went, you know, to Montreal, we're getting our makeup done. I said, I need to apologize to you. He said, yeah, you were really weird. I said, I thought it was somebody else. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> he was really nice, really nice. And Natalie Bai, when we went to Paris, she took me to her country home in in France, and I, she just starts taking off her clothes, and she, I said, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and she had this perfect body, and she says, "I'm getting ready to go uh, for dinner. We will drive you back to Paris." I said, "Okay," and I just realized, oh, this perfect body. She just slips on a skirt and the sweater top, and she says, "Let's go." And her boyfriend at the time, the long-term boyfriend, was Johnny Holiday, who's like Elvis Presley the equivalent, oh. the French Elvis Presley there. And she goes, Johnny, Johnny, come say hello to Mala. And he just opens the patio door and hands me a cassette and says, here, and he signed it, a cassette. So I have Johnny Holiday with a signature and then he slams the door. And I, says, I don't even know who you are, but don't get too high on your head, you know? Hmm. And uh, that, that was that, but it was, a, it was a great experience. I was treated really well and uh, everything was positive and it wasn't done well. It was a very strange, so what did they do in the editing? Something was wrong, something mm -hmm. was wrong, but they played it because I saw the ads in New York and stuff. And you know, the listing, they'll have it in like 200 theaters, you know, it'd be like, it was everywhere Yeah. for two weeks, you know, it was everywhere. And it, then it didn't go anywhere. And there's uh, two other movies called Honeymoon. So it's hard to find. Right. Well, that's the right. thing. It's sort of like, I mean, there was uh there's like a movie from the thirties called honeymoon. And there's like one that was 2014 honeymoon, but the only one that I remember, and I do remember <laughs> that is that one from 1985 in front yeah, of the Highland it. theater. Yep. And um, yeah, I don't know what this, I mean, but, but still, and, 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 and you're right about the poster because it, but it wasn't the poster that necessarily took me into the movie, but I think it was the tag, the tagline, the poster mm. the, and it just being there. But I mean, but yeah, but I, I do remember that uh, that whole interaction. And the thrill for me was that it said, you know, it said Natalie By, John Shea, uh, I think Peter Donay, and Marla Lukowski. I mean, finally, my name was in lights, which was one of my other dreams besides being on the market. Yuck, yucks. I wanted to be in movies. And so mm -hmm. I had that. So you saw me with the blonde. I have the picture of me and the blonde it, outside there taking the picture and a brunette and another one and stuff. And I also, because they gave me, you know, there's always a set photographer taking shots of the actors on the, they sent them to me and I went to the manager and he put them all up in the glass case. So yeah. it was pictures of me with Natalie Bai, pictures of me with Josh, pictures of me eating hot dog. It was like everything. So it was the Marla Lukowski show. Yeah, no, I, I, I saw, I remember going to see a lot of movies at that theater and, uh, 
Well, one of the other memories I have of that theater is uh, going in there with my dad to go see the movie Runaway. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was with Tom Selleck. And I remember my dad asking the uh, woman behind the uh, the cashier or the yeah behind the in the box office. I remember her. Uh, my dad asking, "So what time does the movie end?" And she's <laughs> like, "Oh well, the movie ends at uh, or oh, the next show is at four thirty. And then no, my dad was like, "No, no, no. What time does this show end?" And she's like, "Oh, I think it ends at uh, you know uh, two forty five, and the next shows are four. And he's like, "Oh, okay." And so my dad and I went into the theater. Both of us sat down. The movie started, and then my dad left for the entire movie theater uh, experience, and then he came back in the last couple of minutes of the theater oh. of, the, of the movie, and I don't know where he went for that time. <laughs> Probably to a bookstore or a bar or smoke his pipe, but that's oh. my experiences oh my in that, in that, in that uh, movie theater. Those are my experiences. So that's honeymoon a, that's and, a strong being, one. <laughs> and being my, abandoned by my...